Okay, so the title of the presentation today is Fireblocks on the Future of Custody. Um, we're going to basically go through these three points. So the first thing I want to talk about is custody. I want us all to come to some agreement or understanding of basic concepts in custody. And I want to leave you with the impression that digital asset custody plays a really, really, really important and unique role in the ecosystem. And we'll talk about why that is. Um, I also want to talk about the state of the market, because I don't think we're doing so good at securing digital assets these days. I want to talk about why that is, and I want to talk about what we should do about it. Um, the third point I want to touch on um, is about the dig uh, digital asset ecosystem of the future. Uh, so hopefully we can look a little bit at what Firebox is doing, where the market is headed, and come to some conclusions about what that might look like uh, if we're successful in all the ways that I hope we are. So like I said, we're going to start with custody. Custody is one of my favorite topics, but I think it's really misunderstood. And it was poorly understood in the TradFi context, and I think it got even more complicated in the digital asset context and even more misunderstood. So I only have uh, two bullet points here, but I have three points actually that I want to make. There are three things we need to understand about custody. The first is the distinction between uh, ownership and possession, right? So if I own an asset and I possess the asset, I'm in a world of self-custody. We all recognize this concept in, in digital assets. If I own an asset, but then I give it into the possession or control of a third party, we have now created a custodial relationship. So this is really important, ownership versus possession. A custodial relationship typically has at least two characteristics. The first is a little bit uh, legalistic, but bear with me. So typically when I give an asset to a third party that I own, I'm gonna receive in consideration for that a promise. That's gonna be a promise to safe keep the asset that I give that person. Um, safekeeping is what we call a standard of care. It's a duty or obligation we owe to another person or to another entity. Um, and the only thing to note about safekeeping is that it's a higher standard of care than something like negligence. It says that if I give you an asset, you're going to give it back to me in the condition in which I gave it to you. The other really, really, really important point to understand, right, is that typically the custodian comes with a security apparatus, that's my fancy word for vault, to secure the item you have given it. And this is important. This is important not only for you as the asset owner, this is important for the custodian. I just gave you a promise and that promise is presumably legally enforceable. So if I don't have a really good security apparatus, something reasonably designed for purpose, I'm in trouble, right? That's a bad outcome. So let's drill down a promise, right? Um, we don't have to read all this. I will read the last sentence for you. It just gives us a flavor of what that promise looks like. The custodian shall maintain these assets separately from its own assets and shall exercise reasonable care in their safekeeping. Just pulled from the internet, you can find one of these. Um, what I think is interesting to say about this, right, is custody is a business model. And what you're looking at here is the revenue side of that business model. So a custodian makes a promise in return for the promise, I pay him to safe keep my asset, right? And at this point, the custodian is doing pretty well. He's got a 100% return on an investment for a promise that cost him $0 to make. That's about to get a lot worse for the custodian. The reason that's about to get a lot worse is because to keep that promise, we're gonna need a really elaborate security apparatus. Um, I, like, I like this image. Um, it's got our gold bars, it's got our cash, the door is open, it is fit to be plundered. I like that about a safe. Um, but what I also like about it is I do think these images, these, these vault images with the gold bars, I think they have a special hold on our imagination. Particularly for me, I come from a financial services background. So for me, this feels like a bank. And I think there are a lot of people who think this way too. Um, again, whether it's just in the popular imagination or in the imagination of regulators. And it's for that reason, I want us to keep this image just in the back of our heads because we're gonna return to it. So I wanna complicate what we just kind of set the groundwork for. And I wanna try to put some of this into action in the digital asset context, right? So there's a, a very particular point I'm trying to make on this slide. So what I said was, a custodial relationship arises when I, an owner of an asset, give it to someone else to control or possess. And what I receive in return is a promise that it'll be kept safe. What's happened here is the custodian has assumed the responsibility for the asset. 
And we know they've assumed the responsibility because they've invested a heck of a ton of money in a vault. So they're going to be responsible for holding on to it for us. Something different, uh, different happens in the self-custodial context. So we've already said that we have unity of ownership and possession in the self-custody context. And to illustrate how that flows through into the allocation of responsibilities, I want us all to go to a fantasy Italian restaurant. We're going to go to a nice restaurant. It's going to have white table claws. Oh yeah, we're getting appetizers. We're getting pasta. We're getting mains. In my fantasy Italian restaurant, the bill's not coming. Um, what we're going to do, we're going to get to the restaurant. We're going to go to the coat check. I forgot to mention it's cold. Um, perhaps we're in Milan in winter at this point. Um, but before we sit down, before we can really get comfortable, we need to get our coats off and into the coat check. So when we get to the coat check, something you know, legally extraordinary is going to happen. We're going to get a ticket that looks a lot like this. And even though the restaurant is going to end up in possession of our assets, my coat and your coat, they are not going to take responsibility for any of the articles checked. They're not going to be responsible for returning them to us. They're not going to be responsible for the condition in which they're returned, if they're returned, right? And this makes sense from a commercial perspective. This is a fancy Italian restaurant. They, they're not even giving me a bill. Um, how can they be responsible for my articles? Um, <laughs> so so they're, they're in the business of being a restaurant. They're not in the business of holding on to stuff for me, right? And so we, under, we understand this. We understand this intuitively. And with some reluctance and trepidation, we're going to hand over the coats and we're going to keep an eye on them for the duration of the meal. Uh, but what we would never do under these circumstances is hand over our digital assets, right? And so this is kind of the starting point for self-custody. You are responsible, your keys, your crypto. The way we mitigate that, of course, is with the selection of a custody technology service provider who provides us with the security apparatus that it was the responsibility of the custodian to bring to us previously. What this underscores, this point about responsibility, is one, I think, the importance of a really, really good custody technology solution. But I think, secondly, the importance of arriving at a really good selection criteria, basically having an idea of an answer to the question of what does good look like Continuing on the theme of what does good look like? If you ask a regulator anywhere in the world, pick your regulator, they're going to have an answer for you. It's probably going to have two elements to it. They're going to say, take the digital asset, put it in a hardware device, and keep it in cold storage. Right. Is, this is a popular answer. Is this a good answer? For me, it's incomplete at best. Right. And for me, it's incomplete for one very important reason, and that's because I have a belief, you may share it or not, that information assets are at their maximum utility in motion. You don't have to take my word for it. These are figures from 2024 derived from the Firebox network. You can see we process 3.5 trillion in notional transactional value in the last year accounting for a total of 30 plus million unique transactions. So I didn't do this, folks. The customers did, and the customers are telling me they want their assets in motion. So what can we, you know, how can we sum this up? What can we take away about the role of the custodian in the digital asset ecosystem? And I would posit we can reach at least two conclusions, right? So the first is that Information-based assets are not gold bars. They're not to be locked away in vaults. As our customer data shows, they want their information-based assets going into all of these different places. And from that, we can extrapolate, right, that a digital asset custodian is a custodian that can secure assets in motion. So it's great to lock them away. Sometimes cold storage solutions obviously have a place, but a really good digital asset custodian can enable all of that. The second thing digital asset custody is not, I would argue, is a promise from a responsible third party to safeguard your assets. There is no custodian. No one is bringing the security apparatus, right? You've got to go out and find it. 
And that's where your custody technology solution provider comes in. That could be a hardware solution. It could be a software solution. The important thing is you know what you're looking for. And I think collectively, as an industry, as a market, we don't have a very good idea of what we're looking for. I'll tell you why. So here we're going to, I'm going to tell you why, and then we're going to look into the solution, which for me is global standards. So here we have four data points. We could have put many more. These four data points represent bad outcomes. And the lesson I take from it is that we have too many loss events of too great severity. Too many loss events of too great severity. And I don't think that should be a controversial statement. I hope it's not. Um, one thing you could say to me in response, right, is, Jason, we get it. There are loss events. But it's a novel technology. Um, you know, should folks really be in this market if they're not sophisticated, not only to navigate it, but to assume the risk, right? The only problem with that counterargument, which is, I think is otherwise pretty reasonable, is that it's wrong. And the reason it's wrong gives us the title of this slide. It's wrong because this loss is, in fact, preventable. What do we mean by preventable loss? These are not specific to any one loss event that we've observed over time. These are observations collected from all of them. So we'll just go and run through them. The first is system design, the deployment of outdated systems. Systems inertia, failing to update systems that we know are outdated. If you have outdated systems or badly designed systems, you are at risk of loss, and we have the bad outcomes to prove it. Next, lack of end-to-end -end multi-layer security. So a good system should have redundancy. I think this is, again, very simple, very basic. If you don't have a system designed with multi-layer features of security into it, if you don't have redundancies, you are at risk of loss. We have the bad outcomes to prove it. This is my favorite one by far. I like to imagine Larry sitting on his computer. If you are sitting nearby Larry and you imagine he's not going to click that phishing email at some point, you should think again. Um, if there's anything I could leave this audience with today, right, it's that human failure is immutable and eternal. And if you don't account for it, you are at risk of loss and we have the bad outcomes to prove it. Finally, lack of global consensus around the question of what does good look like. We don't have regulators pushing us in the direction of the good. One, because they have an answer that's incomplete, but that feels all too comfortable to them because it looks like a gold bar in a vault. And then we don't have consensus among ourselves as a marketplace around what good looks like. Here's what good looks like, maybe. This is something we've been working on at a very high level for two years now. On the left, you have principles for risk management, and then you have more uh, prescriptive or detailed recommendations next to it. I'm not going to dwell or walk us through any of this. Um, this can hopefully be a discussion for later. What I will say is that this is the kind of conversation that needs to have, and this is the conversation that's going to move the industry and the regulatory community forward in my view. <laughs> so I think there's a real opportunity, and I think it's present here and now, to move that conversation forward in the way that I envisioned. There are two drivers. We're going to have another slide on each of them. The first is the migration of unregulated portions of the crypto ecosystem into new regulatory frameworks. The second is the replatforming of financial institutions to become stablecoin enabled. So migration to regulated frameworks, where, where we've been operating as an ecosystem for a very long time, and some people liked it just fine, and that's okay, is basically in a variety of unregulated spaces. A lot of projects have launched, grown, scaled, including retail-facing projects, exchanges, and the like. A lot of these projects have adopted custody solutions in a completely unregulated environment. And not only that, they've done it 10 years ago and they've been operating successful businesses ever since. There's been no impetus for change in this portion of the market until, I would argue, now. So what we're seeing now is a migration to what I call a vast CASP-regulated entity status. 
you need look no further than Dubai, which has made this transition itself. But it's basically saying that you're, you're moving from a place where these entities have had no impetus or reason to change to one where their regulator can very easily give them one. Stablecoins and the FI migration. So this is a thesis that I have about what the next few years could look like. And we're going to use the United States as an example because I think it allows us to very easily kind of tease out the threads in what I'm saying. So in the United States context, there is a lot of debate today about adopting legislation that would enable U.S. financial institutions to issue stable coins. What I don't think is understood is the infrastructure ramifications of doing this. Um, so let's just think about a financial institution and it wants to issue a stable coin. It's going to need mint and burn capability. It's going to need the ability to hold or custody. And it's going to need the ability to distribute, which is going to say it's going to have, a, have to have access to secure rails. What I just described to you goes down the entire chain of commerce. So if you're going to have a successful stablecoin ecosystem, you need merchants that can accept it and send it and hold it over secure rails. And you need a retail population that can do the same. What I'm describing to you is an infrastructure project that is about to be undertaken in a major way, potentially. And I'm not saying that it's pushing custody standards itself. I'm saying that this is the kind of opportunity you look for at the beginning of a major investment to be impactful with these kind of conversations, right? As opposed to further down the line when it's harder. Here's just a little example. I mean, I, I couldn't help myself. It was, it was April 28th, just earlier this week. Um, you see here MasterCard unveils end-to-end -end capabilities to power stablecoins. So, you know, I don't need to tell you who MasterCard is, but you can see how I think this fits into the thesis I've been providing you. <clears throat> okay, so the future of custody will end here. Um, so custody, it's going to be faster. It's going to be more connected. And here, I really want to take the opportunity to highlight uh, our partnership with SWE in this respect. Um, this was a partnership we were so excited to make. We share a love and appreciation for innovation in blockchain technology. Uh, we've admired what's been built on the SWE network. And what made it super, super easy, to be frank, was our customers really wanted it. Customers really wanted it for a variety of reasons. They love information assets in motion. And SWE brings them to all the places in the Web3 ecosystem that they want to be in. More secure. So I think we will realize a vision of a more secure digital asset ecosystem. I think the market integrity of the ecosystem demands that we do better, and I think we will. I've called out the SEC here. Um, as was, was mentioned in my, my introduction, I was just down there for a round table, so they are top of mind. But I've called them out because, you know, in all my uh, years having conversations, traveling the world, I've always been struck by how influential they are. And so we're on the topic of custody. The SEC is the source of something called the Qualified Custody Rule. And it's basically the rule that for traditional financial institutions says how and where you can custody assets. The SEC under the new administration is making tremendous progress on moving towards a more friendly crypto regime in the United States. And I can see a clear way to a vision where we don't just talk about qualified custody, but we talk about qualified digital asset custody. So that's the future of custody. The end goal is enabling every business to be a digital asset enabled business. That's where we're headed. That's where we'll get to. And at the very least, that's our vision at Firebox. Thank you very much.